If it wasn't for Garth Ennis, the Punisher probably wouldn't be as popular of a character as he is today. But just how good was that original Marvel Knights run? Woof woof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with another review. A few months ago I asked you guys on Instagram what you wanted me to read for my next review and by an overwhelming margin The Punisher by Garth Ennis won. It couldn't have come at a better time as well considering the controversy surrounding the character but anyway I still wanted to jump into one of the most famous runs for Frank Castle. Written by Garth Ennis and illustrated by Steve Dillon so you've got the same creative team that did Preacher. The first 12 issues of this series were published between April 2000 and March 2001. On the back of just how successful those original original 12 issues were, they were allowed to do an ongoing series. This ran for 37 issues and it was published between August of 2001 all the way up to February of 2004. It was published under the Marvel Knights imprint which means that it had mature and darker storytelling but it was still integrated into the main Marvel Universe and a lot of people may not remember that before this run by Garth Ennis, the one that we're going to be talking about here, Frank Castle and both his character and his reputation were in quite a dire state. There wasn't too many people that were looking to read this character because it all of a sudden had all this demonic stuff that was integrated into it and Garth Ennis just wanted to bring it back to what the character was originally supposed to be. And the success of this series speaks for itself because off the back of this Garth Ennis was allowed to do the Punisher Max series that you can see behind me. Steve Dillon came back to draw the Punisher years later when it was Jason Aaron that was writing it and it was one of the very first stories that got the omnibus treatment back in 2007. However now that it's been over 20 years since this book originally started coming out I wanted to go back and take a very critical look at it and see if it still holds up today or if it was just better than the demonic punisher that had come out before it. Will this be the case that it's just a product of its time? Well that's exactly what I want to look at today and you know that in order to do that we've got to take a look at the plot, the art, we've got a spoiler free section, we've got a spoiler discussion all before my final verdict. But if you've seen any of my previous reviews you know that before we can do that we've got to do the too long didn't watch. So this is my TLDW, it's a part of the video for people who don't really have time to watch the full thing but you still want to know if the book's for you. Normally I give a vague sweeping statement so that you can get a general idea on if this is for you but with the Punisher Marvel Knights series, there's a scene in this book where Frank Castle is running through a zoo, he's got no ammunition on him anymore and he's still got countless goons that are chasing after him so he punches a polar bear to make it angry so that it'll attack them. Right now you're in one of two groups, you're either somebody that thinks that's completely ridiculous and it sounds so far-fetched that you wouldn't be able to enjoy it. If that's you, the rest of the book isn't going to be for you either. Or you're somebody that thinks that's quite funny and you like that goofy kind of storytelling, in which case you're probably going to have a great time with this book. So if that's all the review that you needed, thank you for tuning in. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button if you're new here and make sure you get your paws all over that bell notification so that you never miss a video. Since you're leaving so soon, you might as well check out some of my other videos, but if you want a bit more of an in-depth look into this book, let's start with the plot. When the series begins, Frank Castle's back in New York and doing exactly what he does best killing everyone. He's got a new alias, he's completely forgetting the fact that he was possessed by some kind of mystical entity a few months earlier, and he is once again devoted to his crusade of getting rid of all organised crime in New York. His first target's the Gannucci family, which is led by the oddly intimidating Mar Gannucci. Every time that Frank thinks that he's a few steps ahead, Mar Gannucci has a way of getting the upper hand. And at the same time, the NYPD has assembled a Punisher task force that is led by Detective Soap. You'd think this would be some kind of all-out assault against Frank, but because of the fact that half of the NYPD are scared of the Punisher and the other half actually like what he does, it's kind of a joke division within the department. And Detective Soap is the absolute butt of that joke, he doesn't get taken seriously, nobody respects what he does and nobody has any faith that he's ever going to establish a connection, let alone capture the Punisher. However, the Punisher knows exactly who he is and somehow manages to get him on his side. With Soap feeding him information, this actually works as a through line throughout the story because once the Gannucci family story arc is taken care of, the series kind of follows like a loose plot. There is isn't really too much that connects it together. We see Frank take on the Irish, the Russians, he even goes to an island that's got a nuclear bomb on it. At one stage he comes over to the UK and there's also a storyline that takes place in Texas. And this is all because there is only one thing that is on Frank's mind and that is killing absolutely everybody that he feels deserves it. So admittedly I can't lie there's not too many villains in this that happen to stay the course of the entire book. But because Frank has the rule that he won't kill police officers, his alliance with Soap actually becomes the thing that might end up being his downfall. So well so Soap ever be able to stand up for himself and do the job that he's been assigned? What happens when Frank bites off more than he can chew and ends up facing a foe that is more than he can handle? And what happens when Frank's purpose is brought into question because of the fact that every time he seems to kill one of these Mafia families, another three crop up in the place? 
We're taking a look at the art now, which is mostly done by Steve Dillon, who you might recognise from Preacher. It's a shame because he did unfortunately die a few years ago, but there's just so much energy and passion that comes through in his drawings. The violence is just done perfectly in this, because there's some scenes that if another artist was doing it, it'd be too grotesque and you wouldn't really feel comfortable looking at it, but because Steve Dillon's got that kind of accurate, but also cartoony style, it's just got this kind of comedic effect to it. There's times where people are getting shot in the face, blown up, or they're also just being trapped in some kind of dangerous situation situation, but at no point does it ever feel too grotesque. It fully leans into that element of the ridiculous nature of how Frank operates, and I think that there was nobody that could do that better than Steve Dillon. It is weird because I've read The Punisher Max by Jason Aaron a few years ago, and I thought that the art was a hundred times more violent in this one than it was in there. This time it doesn't seem to take itself too seriously, and it's clear that Steve Dillon is just enjoying himself whilst he's drawing this. The only criticism that I've really got with it, and it's something that I felt was an issue in Preacher as well, but often facial features and facial expressions looked similar throughout the book. And I'm not sure if it's just paying homage, but there's quite a few characters throughout this book that looked exactly like young Jesse Custer and Preacher. And another thing that ended up bothering me throughout the book was that the covers were pretty much redundant. Yeah, they are all great to look at, but I don't think they convey anything that was in the actual book, and at some point it was pretty much the equivalent of clickbait. Like issue 30 had a cover where Frank Castle was on a bike in the middle of New York, but the entire issue took place in Texas. It's almost as if they went up to the artist and said, look, can you just draw us 40 random images of the Punisher, you don't really need to know what happens in the issue, but just make them look good. However, one thing that Steve Dillon did really well is convey a sense of setting. This is something that clearly carried over in his time in Preacher, but if something was a vast open space, you got a really good sense of that. But then back when he was in New York, you always got this sense of scale with everything, like the scenes where he's on top of the Empire State Building, you genuinely felt the height within that panel, if that makes sense. But then when the Punisher came over to the UK, those scenes felt completely different as well, so it really added to the atmosphere with the book. And for a character like the Punisher, where near enough every storyline boils down to he finds someone and kills them, it was just great seeing Frank Castle interact with these different environments and see how his operations and his tactics change as a result of that. Like the storyline in the jungle gave me major Predator vibes and I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but what I'm saying is Steve Dillon was one of those choices to draw the Punisher that you don't think his style would really work well, or it might just be a rehash of everything from Preacher, but it had its own unique sense of identity. Entity. The cartoony aspect to it might put some people off, but I still think that what you get here really conveys the story well and ends up allowing it to elevate beyond the simple storytelling that it often incorporates and falls into the trap of. The issues that weren't drawn by Steve Dillon, I do feel like they lost a lot of the charm, like there was one issue particular towards the latter end of the book where everybody was just drawn really blocky. It's all serviceable, don't get me wrong, but there was times where other characters throughout the Marvel Universe appeared in this Punisher book and I just really enjoyed seeing them in Steve Dillon style. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but I think the Daredevil one is the most famous one, and I loved seeing Steve Dillon's style for this character that I always loved. I actually wish more of the Marvel Universe would have been incorporated into this, so I could have just seen how Steve Dillon would have handled those characters. But even though I think the cartoony style might put some people off at a glance when looking at this book, I think that once you start reading it and you realise exactly what Steve Dillon can do with his style, you really start to love this book even more, and I think it's a great addition to it. We're jumping into the spoiler free section now and I'm going to start by saying that this was one of the only books that I read and I felt like it would have worked better for me if I was reading it in trade paperbacks rather than in the omnibus. That's not to say that the story was bad because I think I read this in about 5 or 6 sittings which is quite good for a book of this size. But after that initial hype and that initial buzz that I got in the Welcome Back Frank storyline I ended up finding myself burning out a little bit. And that's because of the fact that if you're doing a true Punisher story it will often fall into the trap that Punisher does always kill his enemies. It's not going to be something like Batman where the Joker's going to escape from Arkham Asylum every other week. It's going to be a case where the enemies that he goes after are going to be killed or Frank's going to be killed. Because of the fact that he isn't superhuman, it's going to boil to a head at some point and I feel like with this book, he often did it quite quickly. So you probably do get about eight or so storylines, but after about the third or fourth, I kind of guessed exactly what was going to happen each time. That's not me saying that it's bad at all, but I think that Frank Castle might fall into the same bracket as someone like Deadpool. That even though I like the character and I've enjoyed what I've read with 
with their minis. I do think that they're better in small doses. It's a shame because when I was reading this, I found myself often comparing it to the Jason Aaron run, which I felt had a better grasp of just doing one continuous story with this character. But that could be the benefit of writing a max title, and Jason Aaron might have been well aware of the fact that he was only going to be writing it for about 20 or so issues. And at the time when this was coming out, if you were reading it month to month, this was probably something that you were always looking forward to. Because I hadn't read something with the Punisher in so long that when I jumped into it, and obviously you jump in feet first with Welcome Back Frank, this was a great book. I was having such a great time with it and I really couldn't put it down. I loved as well in the beginning that it felt like Garth Ennis had something that he felt he had to prove with Frank Castle. Because of the fact that his reputation was quite bad before this run, you got the sense that Garth Ennis really wanted to bring Frank Castle back to the powerhouse that he could be and tell the best stories possible with the storytelling devices that he had. And I imagine as well, if you were a Punisher fan that was reading this actively in the time, this would be a welcome break from all that mystical crap that had just come before. But reading it now and having read other Punisher stories that have come out later than it, I do feel like some of the storytelling devices are a bit of the time. But one of the things that does stop this book from being completely formulaic and still keeps it interesting is just how much focus is put onto Frank Castle's tactical mind. So the scenes where he's in a jungle against a militia are completely different than when he's in Texas just against like some kind of army gang. Because you just knew that eventually Frank was going to end up killing the person that he was going after, there was no mystery around that, but I just love seeing how exactly he broke that down in his brain, and he wasn't just the go in, kick down the door and shoot everybody. Like yeah, there were multiple occasions where he did end up doing that, but I liked how they ended up giving him a bit more credit for just how intelligent of a character he is when you put him in a war zone territory. Because it brought about what I think is the most important thing to Frank Castle, and that's the fact that he never left the war. To him, he just brought the war back home, and this felt like it was always at the forefront of Garth Ennis when he was writing this character. It probably is a bit simple of me to say, but I did also really enjoy when other characters from the main Marvel Universe appeared in this title. It's quite funny because near enough nobody likes the Punisher, and there were some that I was surprised by, so I'm not going to spoil them here, but we'll talk about them a bit more in the spoilers. But what I really like about this run over other titles that I've read from about 20 or so years ago is you got that sense that it wasn't held back by the main Marvel Universe, but you just used that on occasions to elevate it. So you don't get stuff like House of M or Civil War just derailing the story that he's trying to tell, but you do often get references and appearances to other characters that just remind you that the Punisher is still part of this wider Marvel Universe. And although yes, I do feel a bit underwhelmed with the overall storyline and that there wasn't too much of a through line, I do actually feel like the Soap storyline was something that held this book together. And I think just other side characters in general really set this book apart. So at the beginning, obviously you've got Frank and he's going under a different alias and he's got these neighbours. So he's got Joan and he's got Spacker Dave and it's just those little interactions with other characters in the universe, not people that are actively against him or even people that he's hunting down, but just other people so that he can interact and still find the humanity in others. Those along with the little scenes were so with the parts of the book that really took me by surprise. Because I feel like a lot of Punisher titles can often forget the fact that Frank is still a human, he's still suffering with this grief and he is struggling to connect with other people as a result of losing his family, but he is still somebody that's so devoted to this crusade against crime because of the fact that deep down he still cares about the people around him. It may not seem that way at first glance but you do see in the way that he interacts with other people. And those moments even though there wasn't too many in this book are what reminded you of exactly why we like Frank Castle even though he is this mass murderer. But yeah going back to the soap storyline I do like the fact that it felt like there was a sense of progression here. So the soap that you saw at the beginning did things differently than the soap at the end but I do feel like they made him the butt of the joke a little bit too often because Garth Ennis does have a particular sense of humour that does come across as a bit juvenile. And the scenes with soap in the bar and when he was interacting with other people even though they weren't going to show up throughout the entire book you often got the joke pretty quickly but then you'd still carry on. But when we get to the spoiler section I'm going to talk a bit more about soap there. And the last thing that I'm going to touch on is that even though my feelings towards the book were a little bit inconsistent as the book was going on I felt like it had a really strong opening and a really strong close. And for me to put your highlights there is probably the most important thing like if the beginning's not great you're not going to hook people in and if the ending's bad people are going to remember that more. So in terms of the overall pacing of the book as somebody that's reading it now as opposed to when it was originally coming out, I do think it peaked at the two best points. I just felt like in the middle it could have done a little bit more to spice this up and make it feel like it wasn't always telling the exact same storyline but just copy and paste in a different enemy in. However, I don't think I can say too much more about this book without jumping into spoilers so we're just going to get into that now.
This is your last spoiler warning. If you don't want anything about this book spoiled, jump to the final verdict that's going to be in the timestamp below. But well, straight off the bat, I loved what they did with the Russian in this book. I loved the turn as well when they pumped too much estrogen into his body so that he also resembled a woman as well as this absolute man mountain. And I think out of the, all the non-superhero fights within this book, the Russian was the most formidable foe. So I like the fact that they didn't kill him off straight away and it seemed like he just got crazier and crazier as he kept appearing. Because the problem with the Punisher is that you need a villain that isn't too easy to defeat because obviously the Punisher will kill people if he gets his chance to, but they've still got to pose a realistic threat when they're going up against someone like Frank Castle. The Russian was the perfect blend of that, and although I think the first time that he appeared in this book and he was just completely throwing Frank Castle all throughout this apartment building was just the best moments with him in it, the scenes where they were fighting on the Empire State Building and Spider-Man was there as well were just as tense and they had the same stakes within them as when he first appeared. And although his appearance kept getting goofier the more that he featured throughout the book, the threat that he posed was still there each time. If anything, because of the fact that they opened this door for resurrecting this character as many times as he could, I felt like they killed him off way too soon in the book. Yeah, I think making him survive that kind of nuclear bomb that was detonated on that island might have been one step too many in breaking the realism, but you'd already established so many contingencies for this character, so it could have just been that they'd cloned him multiple times whilst they were in that research lab. I'd have been fine with that, it could have been like aliens, just throw a few of them at Frank Castle and just see what he can do. The only other time that I feel like a non-superhero character has been as much of a realistic match for the Punisher is when it was the Kingpin in Jason Aaron's run, which are pretty big shoes to fill and also a pretty big waistline. But yes, yeah, while I like that those characters that were featured in the first couple of issues like Joan and Spacker Dave, I like that they showed up in the later part of the book as well. It was also really sweet when Frank left them some money because of the fact that they'd helped him when he was wounded. And as I said in my spoiler free section, it was those little scenes that I really enjoyed that just reminded you that there is still a human beneath the Punisher exterior. It actually caught me by surprise because when Joan showed back up and she'd got this new life and she had this new house, I kind of wanted her and Frank to get together. That was the peaceful life that Frank could have had if he just abandoned the Punisher once and for all. But obviously everywhere he goes it follows him so of course it ended up being a war zone there as well. And I like that Spacker Dave went through this entire journey of being a nobody, then becoming some kind of celebrity, and then being a victim of his own fame. And we only really saw that in brief glimpses, I thought that that was something that was really good and like a story behind the panels of the story that you're actually reading. But if we talk about Frank's interactions with characters, there's no way that we can't acknowledge the other Marvel characters that came during this book. So you had Daredevil, Elektra, Wolverine appeared and so did Spider-Man. But I liked how they all appeared in their own story arc and then at the end you see Daredevil, Spider-Man and Wolverine teaming up to try and take down Frank. I felt like that was handled really well but then when I thought back about it after I'd taken a step away from the book, I realised that they adopted the exact same formula in the original storyline. Because you had that with the Holy, the Elite and Mr. Payback. They originally had their own sort of separate stories and then they all converged to try and assemble something for the Punisher. Yeah I remember that obviously they were trying to get Frank Castle on their team rather than with the superheroes that were trying to put him away but still the fact remains that there was a lot of similarities between those two storylines because with those three characters I like that they all had a different reason for why they were killing people but at the same time you got that sense that there was a differential between them and Frank Castle which really solidified why exactly we need a character like the Punisher because he's not just somebody that goes around and just kills everybody because he can. He has got a thought process, a rationale, his own twisted moral code and that's what separates him from everybody else. They had a great way of showing you that rather than just ramming it down your throat and I think the way that they did that with the distinction between the superheroes and the copycat killers worked really great when you look at the story as a whole even if it was pretty much the same storyline that was kind of repeated. But that bit at the end with the trio of superheroes that were going after Frank was probably my second favourite storyline after Welcome Back Frank. It was a great way to end this book and I liked as well that there was this person that had been kidnapped and then you see Frank get him and you're wondering who he is the entire time then it turns out it's Bruce Banner and the Hulk just gets set on all three of them and when you think about it those three characters had a trait that was also in Frank but somehow Frank always managed to get the upper hand so Daredevil is more practical he is going to try and find the most tactically sound way of getting rid of the enemy Spider-Man is a little bit more carefree and he's not afraid of doing something stupid if he gets the job done and Wolverine is just completely ruthless but still those three together still couldn't take down Frank the storyline with Elektra I feel like they could have done a bit more with that I like that there was a bit of chemistry between them but he didn't really have any kind of payoff. I felt like that was one of those appearances that was just there because it was another Marvel character that you could recognise. But still it was a good story, I'm not really taking anything away from it, I just feel like more could have been done. But I said this in the Scott Pilgrim review but I'm changing my approach to reviews so obviously I don't script it as much, I've got some bullet points that I want to talk about so it might seem like some of my points are more rambly or I might miss out something that probably might be more important to other people. I'm not going to go through and read back a Wikipedia page just so I can remember something that didn't leave an impression on me. So if your favourite storyline was the one 
one in Texas, good for you, but for me, it just didn't leave as much of an impression as the other bits that I'm talking about. And that's why I feel like I do have to bring up Soap, because for some people, he might have been a bit of an afterthought, but for me, I feel like he was one of the main continuing factors throughout this book. And although I was a bit annoyed at the way that he was just constantly a joke, his progression towards the end when he was finally getting a bit more respect for himself and he was willing to turn against the Punisher was something that I felt like was one of the best character developments in this book. It might have felt a little bit out of left field and yet it didn't really have the payoff that you thought it would have done but it was just great seeing another character that was kind of going into the same rationale as Frank Castle where obviously Frank was just sick of the way that crime was seen in the city and he was sick of the way that people were being affected by it so he did something about it but Soap is kind of the same that he's somebody that's so sick of the city of New York just walking all over him every single chance that he gets but he isn't willing to take that step that Frank does and that's evident in the fact that he wasn't willing to kill Frank. He thought he was able to but he realised in that moment that there's people that are like the Punisher and people that aren't. And I touched on it before but I think that was something that was handled really well that they established the fact that the Punisher isn't just somebody that goes around and kills people aimlessly. Like there's no denying the fact that he does take joy in killing these criminals but at the end of the day he's killing people who deserves it. And it would have been so easy to just ram that narrative down our throat that he isn't just this senseless killer but they did it in a much better way by having him interact with so many different characters. So when we see him interact and end up not joining up with these copycat killers, we learn more about Frank. When we see him interact with all these other Marvel characters that we know about, we learn more about Frank. And when we see him interact with Soap, and his neighbours, that's when we really start to understand that there is a difference between Frank and just every other criminal that he goes after. And it's not like in the Netflix series where you get the sense that he doesn't actually want to be killing people, it's just something that he feels like he has to do. You get the sense in this book from issue one that Frank Castle actually quite enjoys killing people as long as it's the people that he feels deserves it. You see him dropping somebody off the Empire State Building even though he could have just shot them in the face. He gets off on this sense that criminals fear him and if in the slim chance that that stops someone else going through exactly what he went through with his family, then he's going to enjoy doing it. So if you're somebody who feels like the Punisher may not be a character for you, or maybe you don't fully understand who exactly he is just yet, I feel like this would be a perfect book for you. Obviously maybe not at this point because you're watching a spoiler section on the book, but realistically, even if you know everything about this book, spoilers don't really ruin it for you. It still takes you on a fun journey and I feel like this book had a really difficult job of redefining the Punisher in a similar way as what Jeff Johns had with the Aquaman series, and it knew exactly how how to do that and even if it doesn't develop Frank Castle past what we already knew about him, it defines exactly who he is which is sometimes more important than development. You have to know who a character is before you can grow them beyond that. And if nothing else, even if the storytelling doesn't come across as groundbreaking now, it managed to break ground in the way that it saved the Punisher from being a character that could have faded into obscurity. This is my final verdict, and this book is really fun. I'm glad I read it, and it's something that a few years from now I could easily see myself reading again and enjoying, but I do feel like it suffers from a formulaic plot that crops up every five or so issues. If you're looking for something with a little bit more character development, or maybe a storyline that carries through from beginning to end, I'd recommend something like Jason Aaron's run on The Punisher, but when you think about what you want when you jump into a Punisher book, I feel like Garth Ennis' Marvel Knights run gives you exactly what you wanted. There is great action, it's got a phenomenal pace, it respects Frank as both a war man and also somebody who's on a crusade against crime. But it's got this unique sense of humour that may come across as juvenile in certain points, that manages to bring it away from being this dark, gritty story that could easily happen with a character like Frank Castle. And if you're somebody who likes the main Marvel Universe, this might be a book that's more suited for you than something like Punisher Max. Because it manages to stand on its own two feet, and it saves Frank Castle from the reputation that he almost had from the series that came before this. And even though it might lose its footing a little bit when you you read it all in one go like I did here, I still think that there's enough here that you can enjoy whether you're somebody that's a fan of the Punisher already or somebody who's looking to get into the character. But those issues that I have brought up like the formulaic approach to it and also some of the issues with the accents that go on throughout the book, because yeah it is great that he understands the dialect of those characters but it does make it a little bit difficult to read in parts and understand what's happening and I do think that that's something that could still rub people up the wrong way even today. So even though that I can't say that this is the number one Punisher run that I've ever read, 
and will probably ever exist, I do still think it has its own merits and it's worth checking out if this sounds like it's a book that you may enjoy. Because even though there is a little bit of depth, in terms of the enjoyment of this book it is very much surface level. Because if it already sounds like something you might enjoy based on this review, then it probably will be something and you probably should check it out. However, if it doesn't sound like something that appeals to you, I can't really see it turning you around if you end up buying this book. So my rating for Garth Ennis' Marvel Knights Punisher run is going to be 3 out of 5 woofs. Woof woof woof! So that's my review of this Punisher run and I'm hoping that you've enjoyed it. Like I said, I'm getting used to a new way of doing my reviews so that more of my genuine thoughts can come out rather than me scripting everything so that it doesn't sound genuine. So any feedback on this, as long as it's constructive rather than just going, your shit, is going to be greatly appreciated. I know a lot of you liked it for the Scott Pilgrim review so I am going to keep trying to do it this way. But I would like to hear what other people have thought about this run because I know that some people absolutely love it. Leave it in the comment section below and we can discuss it further. My next review for anybody that's wondering is going to be Spider-Man Craven's Last Hunt. So if you're looking forward to seeing that one, make sure that you're subscribed and click the bell notification so that you can be aware as soon as it comes out. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, why did you get this far? Check out my social media links down below and we've also got our own Reddit page, r slash community. I've also got Amazon affiliate links, which does greatly help the channel. I can't see any of your details. It doesn't increase the price. It just means that eventually I'm going to be able to upgrade the camera. And as well, my next live stream is going to be on February the 19th. Comic Bound's going to be joining me again, so hopefully I'll see you all there. But if you can share this video wherever you can, it is greatly appreciated. And I've got some other videos here that you might wish to check out. My next video is going to be the first one in the Missing the Issue series. So make sure that you're there for that one. But until then, just make sure that you stay safe, stay reading the best books that you can find, and stay mad all you dogs. Woof woof! See you at the next video.